Sometime around 1740, the Cheyenne Nation migrated onto the plains along the Missouri River in South Dakota. While still living as traditional woodland Indians, they had been preyed upon for decades by other tribes and nearly driven to extinction. That changed with the Great Horse Dispersal at the beginning of the century. Practically overnight, the Cheyenne became skilled horsemen. Now capable of handling their former enemies, the Sioux and Crow, they became formidable fighters. At the same time, they also became expert buffalo hunters. Adopting the Sioux teepee for living, the Cheyenne warrior hunter bands could now take their families with them when they needed to follow the buffalo. On the plains, the Cheyenne prospered and their numbers grew dramatically. Militarily, their strength also grew, first through an alliance with the Arapaho and later the Sioux. Together, they drove the Kiowa and the Crow out of the prized Black Hills of South Dakota. 75 years of nomadic life had turned the Cheyenne into a full-fledged warrior culture. In the early 19th century, the Cheyenne had become so successful, they were raiding the large Comanche horse herds south of the Arkansas River. During these raids, many of the Cheyenne fell in love with the region of Kansas and Colorado north of the Arkansas River. It was resplendent with tall grass prairie and buffalo. By 1825, over half of the Cheyenne Nation, joined by many Arapaho, had migrated into this buffalo-rich region permanently. The move was motivated by economics. The Cheyenne chief, Yellow Wolf, met with the Bent brothers, and together they created a highly lucrative trading partnership centered at Bent's Fort on the Arkansas River. For a time, all seemed well between the Southern Cheyenne and Whites. So much so that White Antelope and a light on the cloud, two Cheyenne chiefs, met with President Fillmore in 1851 in Washington, D.C., as did another delegation, which included Cheyenne chiefs Warbonnet, Stand in the Water, and Lean Bear, who met with Abraham Lincoln during the height of the Civil War in March 1863. Oddly, soon after this second peace trip, Widespread hostilities broke out among many Cheyenne and Whites, while other Cheyenne were attempting to change and adopt the lifestyles of the Whites. This paradox and confusion would lead to tragedy. After the Minnesota Massacre, where more than 600 settlers were slaughtered by the Santee Sioux in 1862, fear of the Indians on the plains ran high among Whites. In Colorado, this fear was brought home on June 11th, 1864. June 9th, 10th, and 11th, there were Indian raids all around this area right here. On June 11th, at this site, the Hungate family was killed. Uh, Nathan Ward Hungate, 29 years old, Ellen, 25, and their two daughters, Laura and Florence. Uh, Laura, not yet three, and Florence, not yet five months. Uh, they were killed here. Their bodies were then brought into Denver and displayed. They had been mutilated. Nathan was found about a mile or a mile and a half uh, south of here along the creek, Running Creek, Box Elder Creek. These raids were done by Cheyenne, Kiowa, and Arapaho. Uh, later, Arapaho were identified as the perpetrators of this killing, but it was always identified as a small number, maybe four. But the evidence of the fire at the house in modern archaeology and the weapons found, uh, there's evidence of eight weapons that were used in a long siege here as they were burned out, uh, shows that it had to be a large party, at least 20, maybe uh, 60, and that they uh, uh, took the time to kill this family. Why did they do that? Probably because Nathan shot one of the Indians who was stealing stock, as there had been stock stolen all around this area on June 9th and 10th. And in all of the reports of these Indians is that they were Rappo, Kiowa, and Cheyenne. They were all armed, and there was no violence at all. The only violence was here. Violence occurs later in August on the Overland Trail, um, not far from Colorado and Nebraska and uh, 53 settlers are killed there. And that, along with the murder of the Hungate family, is what fueled the military expedition and the third volunteer 
uh, Colorado Cavalry and uh, Colonel John Shivington to attack uh, Chief Black Kettle Cheyenne Village at Sand Creek on uh, November 29, 1864. A month earlier, near Fort Larned, Kansas, the Cheyenne Chief Lean Bear, just back from his meeting with Lincoln, was gunned down by troopers as he approached, showing the peace medal given to him by the president. Using this attack as an excuse, the Cheyenne dog soldiers made settlers in Kansas and eastern Colorado pay a heavy price. Indeed, this attack added fuel to the raids the Cheyenne had already begun at the same time. In June 1864, Colorado Territorial Governor John Evans issued a proclamation directing friendly Indians to appear at the various U.S. government forts. Two months later, the great Cheyenne Chief Black Kettle requested a meeting with the commander of Fort Lyon, Major Edward Winecoop. Winecoop was highly impressed with Black Kettle. He later wrote, the chief sat dignified, immovable, with a slight smile on his face. A bond of mutual trust was formed between the two men. As a result, Black Kettle, White Antelope, and Bull Bear, one of the leaders of the Dog Soldiers, traveled to Denver to meet with Governor Evans and Colonel John M. Shivington for a council held at Camp Weld. Shivington, a former minister, was the military commander in Colorado Territory and nominal head of the 3rd Colorado Regiment, formed exclusively to hunt down Indians. At the meeting, Black Kettle said, All we ask is that we may have peace with the whites. You are our father. We've been traveling through a cloud. The sky has been dark ever since the war began. In return, Evans accused the Cheyenne of initiating hostilities and said, the time when you can make war best is in the summertime. When I can make war best is in the winter. You, so far, have had the advantage. My time is just coming. At the end of the conference, Shivington stated, my rule of fighting white men or Indians is to fight them until they lay down their arms and submit to military authority. They are nearer Major Winecoop than anyone else, and they can go to him when they get ready to do that. Ironically, both sides wanted peace, and yet the conference ended without any firm commitment to peace from either side. Indian historian D. Brown wrote that Black Kettle took Shivington's remarks to mean that Black Kettle's people would be safe if he brought them to Fort Lyon on the Arkansas River. However, other historians dispute this claim, pointing out that when the Indians went back to Fort Lyon, they stopped at the cattle ranch owned by John Prowers and told him they could not make any treaty of peace with them, meaning Evans and Shivington. On November 9, 1864, Black Kettle and the Cheyenne began arriving at Fort Lyon. By this time, Winecoop had been relieved of his command for being too soft on Indians, such as giving them food and supplies against orders. The new commander, Major Scott Anthony, directed Black Kettle and his band to camp 40 miles to the northeast on the Big Sandy, also known as Sand Creek. Meanwhile, Shivington had other plans. Colonel Shivington, who had been at the Camp Weld Council in Denver in uh, September 64, learned at that meeting that uh, the Indians that he had been hunting for and hoping to kill for several years were probably camped at the Fort Lyon area or on the Big Sandy Creek nearby. In mid-November, he left Denver with his troops, headed downriver down the Arkansas to Fort Lyon, which he reached on the night of November 28th. On November 28th, now in command of 700 troops armed with short-barreled carbines and pistols, and with four 12-pound mountain howitzers, Shivington ordered his cavalry to march to Black Kettle's encampment. There were probably 115, 120 teepees here uh, with uh, maybe 500 men, women, and children. Shivington approached from the south, approached the village. Some of the Indians actually went out to meet him. Uh, as a matter of fact, 
some of the first casualties of the fight here were two Colorado troopers who were shot down off of their horses. There was no mass charge through this village. Uh, Shivington had dismounted his men and they actually walked through the village allowing the Indians to escape up creek and a little bit more to the north, northwest up the creek. Uh, the soldiers walked through the village when they got to the far end. They saw the Indians fleeing and uh, it was at that time that uh, many of the officers lost control of their men. And uh, the men almost on an individual basis started going after the fleeing Indians. They chased them up creek for several miles. As they ran, the Indians dug in at points all along the creek bed, dug themselves uh, homemade rifle pits to uh, make little defensive positions. The soldiers chased them uh, throughout the rest of the day on the 29th. The battle lasted from, again, from dawn up until about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, it was quite a long, drawn-out affair. Uh, there, were, there were quite a few casualties, more than we would think of. Uh, the uh, soldiers took 76 casualties. That was about 25 killed and 51 wounded. Uh, which may not sound like a lot, but in the context of the Indian Wars, that was a that was a heck of a fight. That was uh, put Sand Creek up a number uh, up at the top of the all the fights in the Indian Wars as per casualties. As for the Indians, uh, that was pretty devastating to them. Also, they lost probably upwards of 150 killed. Um, the uh, the things that distinguished Sand Creek here was afterwards uh, uh, after the battle, the uh, the atrocities. Uh, some of the men, again, lost control. Uh, they no doubt were angry. Uh, they had known what had happened through the, for the rest of the summer with the Indian raiding, the, the massacre of the Hungate family in June outside of Denver. And the, the soldiers were uh, taking vengeance. They had, uh, they had scalped and mutilated a lot of the Cheyenne uh, bodies after the fight. The, uh, I no doubt they saw this as uh, uh, a just vengeance and a great victory. Uh, for the Cheyennes, of course, uh, they view the event as a massacre. Miraculously, Black Kettle survived, even while returning to save his wounded wife. However, Shivington's massacre at Sand Creek elevated the Cheyenne military societies, particularly the dog soldiers, into power. Americans back east were horrified by the Sand Creek Massacre. Lincoln removed Governor Evans, and two months after Sand Creek, Shivington was out of the service. Black Kettle's peace attempts had failed, and now the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Sioux, enraged by Sand Creek, chose to make war to the knife. The massacres in Minnesota and Sand Creek inflamed passions on both sides. And for the next 26 years, there'd be a battle to the death for the Great Plains.